Welcome everyone to this month's seminar on spirituality and health. And um, this month we've got Stephen Post giving the talk, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, How Caregivers Can Meet the Challenges of Alzheimer's Disease. So Dr. Stephen Post has a long vitae. He obtained his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1983, um, he has really been a leader in research in terms of the benefits of giving and on compassionate care in relationship to improved patient outcomes and clinician well being. Stephen was uh, director of Sir John Templeton's um, altruistic, uh, what, did, what did he call it? It wasn't altruistic, but. It's it still lives. It's the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. Unlimited Love. That was that was his term. And so I guess, you know, it's still going. So, but Stephen was the guy who started it and directed it. He has uh, addressed the U.S. Congress on volunteerism and health, and he's received several congressional awards for that. He's also gotten all sorts of awards from, from other places as well. If you've seen his bio, you know, he's like one of the most awarded guys you'll ever meet. But in any case, he, uh, he's now at Stony Brook University uh, School of Medicine after moving there from the University of Chicago and Case Western. He was at Case Western University for a long time in the School of Medicine there. And uh, he basically has, you know, written articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association. He's got several books. And in fact, uh, one of his books was designated a medical classic of the century by the British Medical Journal in 2009. So this guy is, uh, is a pretty famous dude. <laughs> now, he is going to um, talk on, on, the, on the topic of his most latest book that is coming out by Johns Hopkins University Press, um, which is the title of his presentation. Now, Stephen and I have been close friends and joking kind of buddies for over, well, I think over 30 years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in any case, Stephen, why don't you take it away and uh, give everyone uh, your presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Harold. Um, Harold's a great old friend, and I often call him with tasteful, mirthful jokes. Like, what did the fish say when it swam into the wall? Do you remember that one? What? The answer is, damn. <laughs> we won't go into that. But this is why I say I'm a bit childish at times. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me get to this presentation. Uh, here we go. Okay. And I want to share. Okay. Can everybody see that? Can you see that? Yeah. Wait a minute. What am yeah, I? We can see I? it. You can see it. You. Can, I, we can see it. You just have to make it into the big one. Okay. We'll do. We'll do. And you can hear me. I can hear you good. Okay. There we go. All right. So this is it. Dignity for deeply forgetful people. How caregivers can meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease. And this is the cover of this new book, which is really meaningful because it captures a lot of personal history especially around Cleveland with a wonderful fellow named Dr. Joseph Michael Foley. Um, how caregivers can meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease with a resilience program by Reverend Dr. Jade C. Angelica, who's really wonderful. She teaches uh, caregivers how to communicate with deeply forgetful individuals. Well, the term deeply forgetful may strike some of you as novel, it is. I'm weary of dementia. Dementia is of course a syndrome. Uh, 
a cluster of symptoms caused by many different diseases, uh, one of which is Alzheimer's. Although Dr. Alzheimer himself did not think he discovered a new disease, he thought he discovered an inevitable aspect of brain aging, and we would all succumb to it if we lived long enough. The epidemiology, well, this is a big problem. Uh, at about age 65, 3% of people have probable Alzheimer's, and it doubles every five years. It goes up and up. Roughly 12 years ago, 13 years ago, epidemiologists were wondering um, maybe if people get to be 85 and above, they're home free, they're in a safe zone. But in fact, the studies of elderly women in their late 90s and even beyond indicates that about 60 to 80% of them have probable Alzheimer's disease. And so it doesn't seem as though there's some sort of bump that you can get beyond and be safe. This is why the National Institute on Aging, I think, spends 60% of its budget on fundamental anti-aging research with telomeres and all of these kinds of things. This has always been a goal of biological science, even from the earliest days when Francis Bacon wrote his great um, masterpiece, The New Atlantis, the, the manifesto of the biological sciences, which ends with the waters of paradise where people will in fact drink and live forever. So we still try to pursue that goal because actually now we're living uh, quite uh, old and, and our life expectancy will vary according to the country we're in. But, but in, in, in general, the, the problems of uh, old age and, and chronic illness are so severe and the, and the solutions are so hard to come by that maybe what we have to do is is uh, figure out uh, how to handle the most uh, uh, challenging uh, and, and predictive issue of all, which is aging itself. So dignity, let me just uh, get right to this. Um, this is an illustration from my boyhood copy of uh, Jonathan Swift's book, Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver travels to all kinds of tribes, one tribe, the Lugnagians are interesting because every once in a while, someone is born and they are called, don't write this down, a Straldbrug. And that means that they're going to live forever. They are immortals. They are what Bacon was talking about. They drunk the fountain of youth. However, in their eighth decade of life, they forget the common appellation of things. They can no longer remember words. They can no longer name things. They forget what was said immediately prior in the conversation. Everybody hates them. They are hated. They burden people. The king of the Lugnagians says to Gulliver, who at first is very excited because look, if, if, if I could live forever, I could expand my creativity endlessly. And that's what Thomas Aquinas argued, by the way, in the Summa Theologica, he said the third reason for immortality, a proof of immortality, is that we have these incredibly rich creative imaginations and they're spiritual in quality. And it would be frustrating not to be able to fully exhaust them. And so therefore we have to posit immortal life from a loving God. So Gulliver is thinking like that, but then the king of the Lugnagians says to Gulliver, take one of these Strollbrugs home to your own people and tell them not to fear death. They are despised. These are quotes from uh, Gulliver's Travels and hated by all sorts of people. When one of them is born, it is reckoned ominous and their birth is recorded very particularly. They are the most mortifying sight I ever beheld and the women more horrible than the men. Something more than implicit bias there. My keen appetite for perpetuity of life, much abated, he says. Send a couple of Strollbrugs to my own country to arm our people against the fear of death. It's really a very, very powerful statement. And, and Swift wrote that 100 years after Bacon wrote The New Atlantis. And it was really a, a, a counterpoint to that sort of uh, uh, utopianism. Now, for those of you who like saints, Jonathan Swift 
was the patron saint for the deeply forgetful. Uh, he was on the board of uh, really the first uh, asylum in, in London that was Bethlehem. And it was actually, uh, the name was changed to Bedlam because it was so chaotic. Uh, people would come in off the streets and they were allowed to throw apples and, 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 and sticks at people who were deeply forgetful. Why? Uh, because Newton had said that this kind of cognitive slowing is due to a thickening of the fluids in the body. And therefore, if you can jolt people and stimulate them, even physically, even brutally, it can be helpful. So Swift quit the board of uh, Bethlehem or Bedlam. That's where the word Bedlam comes from, by the way. And he went back to Dublin, where he was an Anglican rector at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, and uh, he insisted in his will, while he was still lucid of mind, that uh, with all the proceeds he'd gotten from his books, all the royalties, that they build a beautiful site for people with dementia uh, and other illnesses, other mental illnesses, he would say at that time, they didn't make a fast distinction. There would be no pelting, no prodding, no cooling. You couldn't leave them in the basement in the winter just to kind of stimulate them, shall we say, that they would live not under constant fear, but under the protective umbrella of compassionate care. There would be a, the building in the vicinity of general medical care. So it's actually built about two blocks away from Saint, what was St. Stephen's Hospital, which is now the Museum of Dublin. And he said, residents from the Dublin area should be uh, at uh, St. Patrick's and so that their family members can visit regularly. Now, in 1742, after writing his will, this profoundly theological thinker himself succumbed to dementia. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting history about the last uh, nine to 10 years of his life. Uh, this is a interior view of the cabin of a an Irish ferry called the Jonathan Swift. The whole cabin for hundreds and hundreds of feet, it's, it's like a football field practically, is just covered with um, uh, artifacts and statements about St. Patrick's Hospital. Um, he left the little wealth he had to build a house for fools and mad and going on. It's an amazing story. That's the facade to um, St. Patrick's. That is the famous bust of, of John that you see on the cover of his books. So, you know, um, I like Swift because I don't think Swift would ever have succumbed to the horror of hypercognitive values. A, coin, uh, a term that I coined when I was at Case Western in 1995, that somehow human worth, human, the value of a human being is based on their cognitive dexterity, shall we say. Um, that can result in some very vicious practices. So for example, Tirgastrasse 4, or the T4 program, uh, uh, made famous by Dr. Leo Alexander in his article in the New England Journal uh, uh, on medicine under dictatorship. Uh, this is, uh, only lasted a year and a half. And they took 70,000 people out of asylums. These are near, mainly near Munich. Half of them, it's estimated, had developmental cognitive disabilities. Half of them had dementia. Um, and they left them out in the cold to freeze to death. That was the famous hypothermia, the infamous hypothermia research. They said, well, we want to know at what point it becomes futile to send rescue squads into the icy seas of the North Atlantic to uh, to save uh, uh, naval personnel or maybe downed pilots. And they let these people freeze. They put them in vats of ice water. They, they, lie, they lay, them, lay, lay them down in the snow. Uh, and, and then they would bring them back into the asylum and they would warm them up in water, in hot air, uh, at different uh, uh, heat gradients. Uh, of course, none of them were revived. Uh, and this was, of course, uh, absolutely horrendous. And the thing is that these weren't the normal groups that were discriminated against. These weren't Jews or gypsies or gays. 
These were people who were unworthy of life because they were useless eaters, because they were demented. They were dementia. They had declined from a former mental state. And all Western rationalist philosophies of personhood perpetuate this problem, even if not explicitly, because they tell us that a human person is only worthy if Immanuel Kant is taken seriously as a rational agent who can make moral decisions and project them into the future. John Locke in the second treatise on government, you're only a human being under the protective umbrella of do no harm if you can make plans and operationalize them. So that's a pretty narrow view of personhood, of moral personhood. And if you're not a moral person, well, you're still somewhat human, but you're not in the same category. And incidentally, this gets into the whole interface between bioethics and disability research, which I won't go into, but this is Leo Alexander's famous, famous article. He wrote the Nuremberg Code. I hope you realize that. You all have read the Nuremberg Code. This is the guy who wrote it. He was a physician from Tufts University, a very close friend, Susan Wentz of Joe Foley. And um, uh, uh, what, what happened was uh, he observed all this horrendous uh, 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 pain inflicted on deeply forgetful people and other categories. And so uh, in this beautiful article, he said, you know, the only thing we can do for these individuals is have voluntary associations, what political scientists call mid-level organizations. In other words, the Alzheimer's Association, the Spina Bifida Association, uh, uh, all of these organizations that the ALS Association uh, that, that advocate actively for uh, particular groups that are otherwise vulnerable because otherwise they really have nothing. And um, Leo Alexander suggested that we should spend a lot more time studying what goes on in these voluntary associations. Joe Foley, uh, actually was a co-founder of the National Alzheimer's Association. And most of what we did for 20 years around Cleveland, but around the country had to do with um, Alzheimer's chapters. Uh, he felt that this was really incredibly important and it is. So um, I won't go into this in depth, but disability folks tend not to like bioethics because bioethics is all about autonomy, about making decisions uh, not to have this treatment or that treatment, to have a natural dying, which is a good thing in lots of cases. But the disability advocates think of people in categories. They think of people, uh, for example, who need um, support because of severe uh, quadriplegia. And uh, their idea is, well, look, you know, let's have some solidarity. Let's, let's, let's approach this in a galvanized way, because if we don't, society will just uh, eradicate us. Uh, my wonderful friend, Eva Kite, who's the most famous feminist ethicist of care in the world, recently came out with this book, Learning from My Daughter. Her daughter, Sesha, has severe cognitive disability. And uh, Eva and I co-taught uh, courses on the ethics of care. And this is, if I was ever going to recommend a book to anybody, this would be it. So you see, you know, hypercognitivism. I think, therefore, a, a person is early diagnosed and they sense this kind of loss of cognitive capacity and it's painful for them emotionally. They sense that, that loss. If there's a kind point, if there's a kind point in this process, it's probably when people forget that they forget because then they can have whatever relatively benign emotional adjustment they might have uh, into this condition of deeper and deeper forgetfulness. Um, so just to change gears here a little bit, in 1995, I'm sorry, in, in, in 2015, I went to uh, Bangalore, India, to the Indian Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, they had picked up on this idea of deep forgetfulness in this book I'd written in 1995, uh, which Harold referred to earlier. Um, um, and we had a whole conference on consciousness and the deeply forgetful. And believe it or not, uh, Bangalore is an interesting place. Uh, a lot of the 
uh, followers of uh, the Dalai Lama uh, uh, are there. And uh, uh, a very great Indian philosopher uh, came in surprisingly, sat at the desk in the back. No one batted an eye. And I was saying that, you know, what's valuable about human beings is not their linear rationality, not that rationality that gets them from point A to point B, but their consciousness. The fact that they can still enjoy the fall leaves, they can still um, be creative, they can still smell beautiful apple pies. That's what makes them valuable. And if they weren't conscious, of course, they'd be in a persistent vegetative state or they'd be dead. So uh, he put his hand down on the table and he said, yes, there's no reason to think less of somebody because they are forgetful uh, than, uh, than someone who is perfectly memory intact. And I have a letter from His Holiness right up here on my wall indicating that, and he was able to endorse dignity for deeply forgetful uh, in a very beautiful way. Um, dementia is too negative a term. Uh, it, it's a term of decline and derision. Um, deeply forgetful is more mystical because you're all interested in spirituality. It's a, it's a mystical term. It's a term of inclusivity, of affirmation, of a continuum of forgetfulness um, that beneath this veneer of chaos or of silence, there's something uh, that we don't fully understand. But we cannot say that they're gone, they're a husk, they're a shell, or whatever negative term we might apply. Now, St. Augustine in the Confessions said that we are all forgetful. He said, we are all demented. Think about that from a theological point of view. We are all demented because we forget our source. We forget our source. We forget the light within. We're so busy running around in chronological time. We're so busy doing instead of being that we forget our source. And so in that sense, St. Augustine thought that we are all demented. I don't think we're all demented, but <laughs> I'll tell you, when I go into Penn Station and I see people racing through that place, I think, oh goodness heavens, we are all pretty far gone. Um, I coined a term called paradoxical lucidity as well. And that's a term that um, uh, gets to the question of, people who have been long um, incommunicado, they've had their chin down on their chest, they haven't spoken a word for a long time, but somehow or another, they have this moment of lucidity uh, and they, they know who they are. They come into uh, their self-identity despite neurological adversity. If you want a quote about this, Romans 8.31, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. This is Joe Foley. So Joe Foley, I see Renee, right? So Joe Foley and I went out to Heather Hill, which is in um, Chardon, Ohio, north, northeastern Ohio. It's a, it's a nursing home, was a nursing home. And uh, they had a, a, an Alzheimer's unit. There were about 25 people. That's your typical census in one of those units. And we read the little biographical sketches on some of the uh, doors to the people's rooms. And they were all out in the, in the larger walking area, which was very specially designed. So we read the bio sketch of a guy named Jim. And it turns out, you know, Jim had worked. He'd, 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 he'd grown up in, in Ohio. He had a couple of, of sons who were growing up. So Joe and I went out and we asked the nurse, well, where's, where's Jim? We'd like to meet him. So she brought us over to Jim. And uh, we sat him down and I asked him, so how are your, how are your sons? How's, uh, how's Jamie and how's, how's Will? And he couldn't respond at all. He, he, he was not verbal. I don't think he understood a word I said. However, he had a twig in his hand and it had been painted white. It was a very special twig to him. And he put it in my hand. And he said three words. He said, God is love. And Joe was right there. And, and, and then we went to the nurse and we said, what's the story with this fellow, Jim? Turns out he'd grown up at, on a farm in Ohio and his father uh, had raised him up in, the, in a church. And, and his, his um, 
chore every morning was to bring kindling in for the fireplace. And so like a lot of people with deep forgetfulness, because they're, they're struggling, the world is coming at them, buzzing and booming and beeping. They, they tend to go back, call this attachment theory 101, to that point earlier in life where they felt tender, loving care. So this guy, Joe and I thought, as we talked about it on the way home, had gone back to his father, had gone back to that symbol of meaning and love and purpose in, in his life. So there was Jim, deeply forgetful. But you know what? Somehow or another, he didn't forget one thing. He didn't forget his source. Paradoxical lucidity, consciousness unexplained. End of lucidity in dementia patients. This is, we won't go, we won't look at this, but uh, it's a wonderful YouTube by Rudy Tansy, who's the Rockefeller professor of neurology at Harvard. And Rudy is really studying this seriously. And, and so are a lot of other people. Um, here's another statement uh, from the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia uh, about a paradigm shift. Unexpected cognitive lucidity and communication in patients with severe dementias especially around the time of death, but actually, I don't think so. I think that's a little too extreme. It, it can happen in quite a wide window of time, have been observed and reported anecdotally. Here we review what is known about this phenomenon, related phenomenon that provide insight into potential mechanism, ethical implications, and methodological, methodological considerations for systematic investigation. Joe and I, uh, for any Ohioans, um, went to Mount Vernon, Ohio, where there is a psychiatric hospital for uh, older adults. And one unit is devoted to people uh, who, have co who basically have uh, cognitive disabilities, uh, but they also then succumb to Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is not, not uncommon. And the caregivers were all these wonderful nurses and nursing assistants uh, and they were Hindus. They lived in a Hindu community nearby. Um, most of these folks, by the way, in the unit had Down syndrome. So we took a number of these nurses out to a pizza place in Gambier, Ohio, which is where Kenyon College is. And we asked them, Joe and I were amazed. We asked them, so, you know, what makes you so meticulous? I mean, they were so caring. Namaste. I honor the divine in you. You honor the divine in me. They saw something divine in these deeply forgetful people. And this is what they said. They said, namaste. I mean, how can they, how could they treat someone differently? Because everybody has an eternal value. It was quite impressive. Um, so I was happy that uh, a few years ago, um, the National Institute on Aging uh, actually uh, had a workshop on uh, paradoxical lucidity. I wasn't there but uh, it was well attended. And um, they actually put out an RFP, a request for proposals uh, for researchers who could study this state of being, these, shall we say, briefly awakened moments. Uh, how you would do that is of course a big question. Uh, but the idea is that you could uncover mechanisms underlying cognitive decline, identify potential preventive or therapeutic approaches offer more effective strategies for caregivers, and perhaps even expand our understanding of the nature of personhood and consciousness. There you go. His Holiness is happy. Now, we won't look at this, but you could do it on your own. This is a video of Leonard uh, Slatkin, the conductor of the Detroit Symphony, um, and he's just about to conduct Appalachian Spring, but he turns to the audience and he says, Aaron Copeland succumbed to Alzheimer's disease in the last several years of his life. He lived in a house uh, up along the Hudson in Peekskill. And people would come up and they'd visit him. And he couldn't communicate with them, but they had a sense that he was still there. And then at one point, uh, he rose up surprisingly and he walked to the piano and he played the six notes. There are th actually three notes to two chords that form the structural baseline of Appalachian Spring. And then Slatkin, who was a great conductor, uh, 
uh, I used to listen to him occasionally because I was in Ann Arbor and I would get into Detroit. Um, he turns and he says, so what was Copeland trying to tell us? Was he trying to say, I'm still here? Was he trying to say, this is what I want to be remembered for? And then he turns and he does the most beautiful version of Appalachian Spring I've ever heard. I don't want to show it to you because you wouldn't let me go on with my presentation. Copeland, so long as the human spirit thrives on this planet, music in some living form will accompany and sustain it and give it expressive meaning. You've all heard of music and memory, um, um, which is an incredible intervention. Um, and um, people who really have not expressed themselves in a long time, if they get personalized music that they identify with from earlier in life, suddenly they'll get somatic, they'll, they'll sing, they'll, they'll, they'll chime in, and they kind of come back into who they are, for at least for a period. And it's fleeting, but it's incredibly inspiring for caregivers because they feel, hey, you know what? Grandma's still there. So I was doing a presentation at the Time Center in New York uh, some years ago in 2013 uh, about deep forgetfulness and about continuity of personal identity, despite appearances to the contrary. And uh, I got an email from this woman, Olivia Hobblesell, who'd written a very, very good book about caregiving, uh, 10,000 Joys and 10,000 Sorrows. A couple's journey through Alzheimer's. And she emailed me this. She said, in that late stage when words are gone, except for those occasional moments, she, her mother, looked at me intently and said forcefully, her mother had been a physics professor, God, physics, and the cosmos. Okay, so there you go. Um, the music and memory work is amazing. Uh, and people are studying now the medial prefrontal core uh, cortex and how it links memory, music, and emotion. It's, it's very, very powerful. So what do hypercognitive philosophies of personhood fail to notice? They fail to notice creativity. People with dementia can be incredibly creative. Um, I was in uh, St. Louis once upon a time at a program for Alzheimer's uh, individuals and artistic creativity. And there was a guy who in the mornings, he would, he had his pencil and, and paper. He would, he, and on and on and he, so he, would, he would sort of scratch around, but there was always this coherent line down the middle that looked like a little bit like a, a tree. And I would ask him, so Herb, what is this? He couldn't answer. But one morning he said, this is a map. So my daughter can find her way to my house. So that symbolic rationality was still with him. Emotion, um, relationality, including dogs, mirth, somatics, somatic memory, music and rhythm, which is so deep and so evolved. Beauty, the recognition of beauty, smell, taste, spirituality, yes touch, consciousness, continuity of self-identity. Those are the things that really matter. This is a picture from Willem de Kooning who hung out in Greenwich Village, got in a lot of fist fights. He was an abstract expressionist. He drank a lot. And uh, um, you can see the anxiety of his work. This is like W.H. Auden's The Age of Anxiety. Uh, de Kooning was the one who captured that visually for us. Like just everything's falling apart. The center can't hold. There's no spirituality for us where we can find respite and peace. We're just being splintered. <clears throat> and uh, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease by Norman Relkin at uh, uh, Cornell Weill. Uh, Norm's a great uh, neurologist. And for 14 years, 14 years, get this, okay? Willem de Kooning painted. He lived in a loft off Bleecker Street. He had one assistant and he was, he, we, you know, he, he, he deteriorated, but every day he was still able to dip his paintbrush in acrylic and he'd go up to the, up to the canvas and he would, he would paint. And, and, and it was beautiful. 
Now, you know, for 13 and a half of those 14 years, he painted. And then there was a posthumous exhibit, okay? And <clears throat> I liked de Kooning. My mom, Marguerite Post, was an abstract expressionist. So she, I sort of grew up on de Kooning and Larry Rivers and other such people. And uh, so I was reading the reviews of his exhibit. <clears throat> and the reviewers said, oh, he was, he's just, he's a, he's a husk. There's nothing left. This is empty and meaningless. But there was a reviewer from the, from, uh, uh, the New Yorker who said, wait a minute, this is a guy who, despite having probable Alzheimer's disease, he knew who he was. He knew what he was. He knew he was an identity. He, he, was, a, he was a painter. He knew his calling. He knew, even in that deep forgetfulness, that he was still a wonder of nature, a miracle of the universe, and he could paint and he could be creative. And he never lost that. That's not linear rationality. That's not the rationality that gets me from here to the Starbucks down, down the hallway, but it's a different kind of rationality and it's just as important. Tactile and relational uh, sensibilities are powerful. I was on the board of uh, the Alzheimer's Association in Scotland for a few years, in Stirling actually, and we started the Alzheimer's dog room because it became clear to some of the researchers there, the people who were deeply forgetful could really connect with dogs, you know, friendly, nice dogs, ideally Labradors, but not necessarily. And so I was in Brooklyn Heights giving a talk about uh, the deep, deeply forgetful. This is some years ago, maybe six or seven years ago. And <clears throat> I talked about dogs. In fact, I gave a whole lecture on dogs and, and, um, and the deeply forgetful. And a woman emailed me, Meryl Berdugo. I've never met her since then, but she did come up after the talk. And she said, bringing Lola to see Alzheimer's patients has made a tremendous difference in helping me open up the line of communication. Take Marvin, who is 91 and lives at home with his wife. He has advanced AD, he has a full-time aide and sleeps in his own room while his wife has the master bedroom. Marvin had walked into her bedroom, fell asleep in the bed since the morning. The aide, the wife couldn't get him up. I walked in the room with Lola. I put her paws on him and said, Marvin, get up. Look who's come to visit. Marvin popped up excited to see Lola. I was able to lure him out of bed and into the family room where his wife was. He couldn't contain his excitement. His wife and aide couldn't believe it. Lola brought back his memory of his dog, Sparky. Now, we don't have this enough in the US, but in Australia, Alzheimer's dogs are a big deal dementia dogs. They're well-trained. <clears throat> so I was giving a talk on the dog movement in Sydney. <clears throat> um, and in the afternoon, we had about 100 or so individuals with dementia, you know, still ambulatory, uh, walk down the main drag uh, toward uh, uh, the uh, uh, Sydney Hospital, the Hospital of New South Wales. And they all had their dogs with them, you know, and, and and uh, they, they were perfectly happy, they were doing well. And this guy pulled up in a taxi and he said, what's this? Dogs are for blind people. <laughs> and so I tried to disabuse him of that thinking, but you know, there are a lot of places in the, in the world now where, where dementia dogs are very, very important. So I'm talking really about symbolic rationality too. De Kooning's brush, Jim's twig, you know, at, in, in Chardon. Again, linear rationality is not morally important. It's, 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 it's rationality as a source of self-identity that really matters. It's the rationality of who we are more than how we proceed, right? And you'll find that there are people who are very, very far along, even in end-stage Alzheimer's, and they'll still be clinging a rosary or some other artifact. Um, so what is hope? Uh, hope is different in every context of illness, but to me, um, hope, which is a spiritual virtue, is being open to surprises, noticing the continuity of selfhood. I think to be connected with the deeply forgetful, you have to be, and I'm quoting Larry Dossi here from his book, One Mind, you have to be a noticer. You have to be a noticer. You have to just want to, want to not attribute, but you want to notice these indications of meaningful uh, personhood. Uh, years ago in, in, the, in Richard Newhouse's journal, First Things, I did an article on Alzheimer's and grace. Richard and I used to talk a lot about Alzheimer's. 
Talk even to the most cognitively disabled, calling them by name. Speak with a warm and calm voice, with a joyful facial expression, bending down to make eye contact, communicating with them rather than around them. And you know, people um, who are deeply forgetful, they pick up on kindness. They can sense it in the people around them, but they can also be kind. So that fellow Jim I was talking about earlier, so Joe and I asked, the, you know, we asked the nurse, um, <clears throat> why the twig? And she said, because that was his chore in the morning and he loved his father and he'd gone back to that. So then in, in this special unit, um, there was a, a rag doll on the floor that looked like it had been made in 1935. There was no hair left on it. It was a puppet doll. Um, and there it was on the floor. It looked like it had been through hell and, hell and back. And lo and behold, it was really kind of miraculous. Jim um, walked over to that doll and he picked it up and he brought it over to the corner of the room where there was a woman whose name turned out to be Rebecca and she was weeping, she was weeping. And he put the doll on her knee and she stopped crying and he walked away. And we asked the nurse and it turns out that that was her doll from when she was a little girl. So there was a culture of kindness despite deep forgetfulness. I. Um, I don't like to use the word love too much, but in this new book, I actually do have a, a chapter on love. And I just use a term that I picked up from the psychiatrist, Harry Stack Sullivan, one of my favorites, who figured out that schizophrenia can be interpreted as a social condition. And he said that when the happiness and the security of another is as real to you as your own, you love that person. No fancy language, no archaic uh, phrases, just common sense. But it's the way in which love is expressed with the deeply forgetful, respect, celebration, listening, loyalty, creativity. Their creativity is immense. Care frontation, when their behavior gets way out of line sometimes, maybe when they're sundowning, you know, you have to be able to approach them <clears throat> in a fashion that still maintains calmness and connection and, and love. That's the word, by the way, that two people coined uh, way back in 2005, M. Scott Peck and myself, because he was a graduate in psychiatry from Case Med. And we carried on a long correspondence. I have files of letters between Scotty and myself. We wanted a word other than confrontation. So we came up with carefrontation. Forgiveness, a lot of forgiveness helping, compassion. you got to have these assets as a caregiver or it's very difficult. And I will say too that um, I have always, as long as I can remember, been a bit of a mystic. And um, I do think that it's wonderful when caregivers sometimes do talk, and there's a, this is in a chapter in the book, about their, their experiences at least as they self-perceive it, of some strength of love that goes beyond themselves because they are limited. I mean, caregivers have high depression rates, they, they get frustrated and so forth. But just for those of you who could not ever believe that a thoughtful person could think in these terms, uh, my favorite poet of all time, W.H. Auden. I have right on my shelf here, The Age of Anxiety. And he was, he hung around Oxford uh, a lot and he was kind of uh, popular. Uh, uh, there were a lot of people who gathered around him and they kind of hung on every word. And he wrote uh, an introduction to a book called The Protestant Mystics. And this is what he said. He said, one fine night in June, 1933, I was sitting on a lawn after dinner with three colleagues, two women and one man. We liked each other well enough, but were certainly not intimate friends, nor had any of us a sexual interest in another. Incidentally, we had not drunk any alcohol. We were talking casually about everyday matters when quite suddenly and unexpectedly something happened. I felt myself invaded, what a metaphor, invaded by a power which though I consented to it, 
was irresistible and certainly not mine. For the first time in my life, I knew exactly, because thanks to the power I was doing it, what it means to love one's neighbor as oneself. I was also certain, though the conversation continued to be perfectly ordinary, that my three colleagues were having the same experience. In the case of one of them, I was later able to confirm this. My personal feelings toward them were unchanged. They were still colleagues, not intimate friends, but I felt their existence as themselves to be of infinite value and rejoiced in it. That's WH oil. And, and, you know, um, we used to write articles in, in Cleveland from the Foley Elder Health Care Center. We had focus groups on the spirituality of caregivers and how they sustain themselves through these kinds of uh, events and activities and so forth. And it's really very powerful. So I'm not going to go too much longer, but look, there's a lot of biomedical frustration out there. Uh, there's no magic bullet. Uh, we've been wanting to have a world without Alzheimer's. This goes back actually to 1996. Uh, the idea that somehow we'll come up with a cholinesterase inhibitor that will do it all. And now, of course, that's not even a target for pharmacological development. Um, um, it's been a very tough battle. You know, Alzheimer's is, 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 is hard to do anything about. It's not quite like HIV, where you, you, know, you get a three-drug cocktail and voila. It's much more complicated, and it's not even clear what it is, what its biology is. Uh, what is, what's causative? Is it inflammation upstream and the plaques and tangles are just downstream epiphenomena? Or what is it? We just don't know. So it's a big problem. Uh, Biogen, you know, have been in the news recently uh, uh, with, 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 with a new drug that, uh, that uh, diminishes the, uh, the hard amyloid plaques. But no one really thinks necessarily that the plaques are causative. And so you could diminish their volume, but it would have no impact uh, from a basic observational view on uh, the Alzheimer's itself. So an FDA panel voted zero to approve, uh, 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 10, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, oh yeah, zero to approve, 10 no, and one uncertain. And this was the, an FDA panel that included some very prominent neurologists. And of course, it was in all the newspapers. But then about two months later, uh, the FDA, for all kinds of political reasons, uh, approved this. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but we're really having a hard time finding a magic bullet. If I was going to say what's really maybe helpful, it could be a Mediterranean diet. I'm not sure. Get some exercise. Be socially and intellectually engaged. In a nutshell, walk peacefully with friends to a Greek restaurant and then play poker on the way home. Meditation to de-stress. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Koenig knows this gentleman quite well, Dharma Kozla. He's done some very, very beautiful work. Um, nobody in neurology these days doesn't think that, that protracted stress over the years contract, contributes to hippocampal atrophy, which is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Of course, it slows wound healing, it converts uh, metabolites into fatty acids. It's got a lot of downside. But um, stress is a very serious problem. And if we do live in an age of anxiety, and, and, and you know, the poet Auden had it right. I, I mean, it, I think he really caught it. You know, he captured this age we are in. Uh, um, I think that maybe Alzheimer's has, has something to do with, with the way we live our lives and our difficulty in stepping out of the pressures of chronological time doesn't mean everybody has to do what uh, Eckhart Tolle did and sit for two years on a bench in Washington Square and realize that he can live in the now. <laughs> I'm not that extreme, but <clears throat> um, but we do live in, in an age of anxiety and that this may be a factor. Uh, consider a dementia dog, do music in memory and worship. Now, some of you are ministers. Um, one of my friends in life was a New Testament theologian named Leander Keck, who was the cat's meow at Yale Divinity School for many years. Um, he knew every ancient language. Um, his son um, wrote a book uh, about uh, Leander's wife, Janet, who succumbed to Alzheimer's disease. And she would wander around 
uh, the Yale Divinity School, which is a pretty safe area, although not entirely so. And people would just sort of interact with her best they could. She got pretty far along. And so what happened was she would go to that beautiful chapel at Yale Div School, which I remember from being a 15 year old boy when I, I would come down there from New Hampshire from time to time. And they would have these services and she would chime in with the hymns. She loved the Psalms. She would come into herself, she would get rhythmic, she would get somatic. And, and then for a while, even five or 10 minutes, she would have a sense of who she was and she could actually um, respond to uh, closed-ended questions, not open-ended questions, but closed-ended questions. So David Keck, uh, her son, wrote a beautiful book about this that won a big award. So, so I, I'm not sure what the solutions are, we'll see. Um, I like Gayatri Devi's book, The Spectrum of Hope, an optimistic new approach to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, where she really talks about a, a full integrative uh, approach. Uh, purpose may be helpful. These are these nice studies that come out of uh, Rush Presbyterian Hospital in, in Chicago uh, on a purpose in life. And it turns out, this has been replicated, that older adults with a high purpose, they do a scale of purpose, if they really have something to live for, and it's usually altruistic, it's usually they want to do something for others, it kind of brings out their, their best. Um, the word uh, flower, by the way, comes from both the, the, the plant, but also bringing out the best in Latin. And, and so the high quartile on purpose had a 30% lower rate of cognitive decline than the low quartile. Actually, it's kind of commonsensical. Um, I, I'm not sure it's, it's going to prevent Alzheimer's, but it's worth thinking about. I'm not going to go into ethical quandaries. The prevalence of pain is a very serious difficulty, and it's only in recent years that people have realized that, hey, you know, that pain that's being expressed by the person with Alzheimer's who's screaming in their bed, it's not just that they're demented, it's that they may have chronic arthritis and some other condition underlying. So now we have really great uh, pain scales. I actually got certified in, 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 in pain AD some many years ago. You look at breathing, vocalization, facial expression, body language, and so forth. And um, this is a really, a really great note of progress. Older persons, uh, if you just talk with coherent uh, older adults in a family um, clinic, they'll tell you 95%, they don't want anything done to um, extend their lives should they have severe dementia. Uh, they don't want cardiopulmonary resuscitation, respiration, feeding pegs, and so forth. Um, and by the way, my last little ethical quibble here, um, I'm not a big fan of feeding pegs. Um, the, the, the peg, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, was invented in 1979 by Michael Gowderer, who was a professor in, the, in Rainbow Children's Hospital, Brene. And he wanted, he wanted something for kids who had these swallowing difficulties, which made sense. Um, someone with Alzheimer's, you can't maintain them for a long, long time with a tube down their throat because the tube deteriorates. So in 1985, for the first time, people started taking pegs, which are just put in through the gut. Well, it's a little more complicated than that and applying them to people with deep forgetfulness and slowed eating. <clears throat> uh, lo and behold, um, you had a huge rise in infection rates because these people have no idea what that little two inch of tube is sticking out from their belly. They pull on it and then they have to be restrained and then they're sitting in their urine and feces and the like. So um, uh, this was a big deal for about five years. And now, you know, it's, 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 um, going on a lot less. In Canada, they use no feeding pegs for people in advanced dementia. Basically, they do assisted oral feeding, which is what I did with my grandma post. You know, I learned about applesauce and all kinds of things. And, and there was a kind of ritual rapport that went on between the two of us. And surprisingly, of course, you have to be open to surprises, right? <clears throat> um, she would call me by name from time to time. And that was really quite amazing. So um, I was in, in uh, Iowa at the governor's uh, task force on uh, Alzheimer's disease and this wonderful nurse, Debbie Johnson, she was great. 
Uh, she had written this book, Nutrition and Alzheimer's Disease. And so this is what I did with my grandmother. This is way back in like 19, you know, 77, 76. Uh, juicy gelatin, milky gelatin, applesauce, prune bread. Uh, I mean, uh, small delights are large if you're if you're if you've got severe Alzheimer's disease, <clears throat> and so palatial stimulation really matters, and the kind of ritual interactions are important. Uh, I'm not going to talk about um, physician-assisted suicide. I just did an article on this with a lot of people from UCSF, uh, and this is a hot uh, a hot item. There was a guy with Alzheimer's in San Francisco. He'd been a street clown all of his life. One of these people who is out in front of the museums and he's clowning around and entertaining folks. So he gets, uh, uh, he gets Alzheimer's and he's on a research protocol with UCSF folks. And he keeps saying, you know, I want to go to Switzerland. I want to go to Switzerland and I want to, I want to go to Dignitas, which is this place where basically they will euthanize you. And, um, this was hotly debated. I mean, this team went back and forth. Uh, but in the end, just on his own, he had enough money and he had the capacity. He took a plane, uh, he went to Europe, and he's not been seen since. But this is um, really encroaching on us. Up in Canada, in Quebec, this is legal now. So if you, if you want to practice what I call surcease or preemptive uh, suicide, uh, it's allowed. This is um, the ultimate question of to be or not to be. When I was at the University of Chicago as a grad student, I had two professors. Both of them were psychiatrists, and they were very close to me, and both of them succumbed to probable Alzheimer's disease. One of them, Chase Kimball, who had a lot to do with the biopsychosocial model, he lived another 12 years. He was in a nursing home in Hyde Park, and he had a loving family, and they took pretty good care of him, and he had some good moments. Um, but another one it took 40 sequinols and put a plastic bag over his head. And if I gave you his name, you would recognize it. Um, but I couldn't judge him because I thought, you know, um, who am I to say? So um, those are just some comments on spirituality and deep forgetfulness. Again, just the term deep forgetfulness itself to me is a mystical term, is highly inclusive. Um, and um, it's, it, it keeps us from thinking of them versus us. I'm fully mentated and that person is dementated. I think that's bad, bad thinking. Uh, you know, we all forget sometimes where we park our cars. It's not a good thing if you forget that you have a car that's parked, as Joe Foley used to say. Although I once did that. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and I, for in a particular context, but um, um, I think it's really important to come close to the experience of, of dementia, understand these narratives, uh, be one with these people, and then develop these empathic virtues and compassionate care is everything that means so much to them. And then it's this outer circle of health systems and justice and providing more than you know, 12 bucks an hour for nurses assistance. Um, so, so um, that's how I think about these matters, and I'm really honored uh, to be to be among you this day, Harold. Um, that's about it. Should we should we should we stop sharing and and have some a? Stephen, just brilliant, just brilliant, and and exactly what I anticipated and expected. So thank you so much for a moving presentation and informative one. Um, let's take, we have maybe uh, up to five minutes maximum for questions, but I suspect there are going to be a number of questions. We'll have to cut it off after uh, after five minutes, but go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Stephen a question. Yeah, just shout it out. Hi, Stephen. Uh, my name is Olutayo. Uh, I'm a doctoral student um, at St. Stephen's College, University of Alberta, here in Canada. Uh, um, I quite uh, appreciate your presentation. Uh, I think it resonates with me because uh, that's more of what um, I'm researching on. Um, I'm looking at um, the, um, the importance that is attached to um, 
understanding how uh, people with developmental disability express their spirituality and how that can impact the, the pastoral care ministries of, of the church. So I, I think what you just presented, you know, uh, has gone a long way to uh, inform my worldview about how to deal with this issue. Then my question is, considering the empowerment model of disability and giving the need to value and promote the dignity, choice, and autonomy of persons with asthma, what specific roles can caregivers play to faithfully assist them to flourish as truly human persons? You're going to have to read this book. <laughs> the mother of all questions. But I will tell you, yesterday I was actually uh, doing a conference call with my old mainstream Episcopal church in Cleveland Heights, St. Paul's. Um, and uh, I know, Renee, you'll, you'll remember that. Um, and you know, they, we were asking, so OK, it's all right when a, when a baby or toddler is in the back of a church screaming chaos. That's okay if it's actually even cute, you know, and everybody's tolerant. I mean, maybe if it gets too bad, uh, a parent will take a baby out of the out of the worship space. But if someone is in there who's deeply forgetful and they're sounding incoherent, um, they may not be screaming things, but uh, it's really kind of persona non grata. So we really have to think about um, about this. That's why I like Augustine so much, you know. But Plato would say the same thing. I mean, Plato. Plato believed that we were all demented. I, I, and he didn't use the word dementa, dementia, but, but, but you know, he believed that there was a light within and that we're all somehow living in a cave, you know, Plato's cave. And, um, and, and every once in a while, actually, um, Austin used this metaphor, you know, we're like a, a, a school of fish in the dark sea. And, and every once in a while, a fish will jump up to the surface. It sees a little glistening, a little glowing up there. It jumps up into the air and sees the sun, you know? And then it comes down and tells all the other fish, hey, there's a sun up there. And, and it's, it's, this is horribly uh, uh, poor analogy, but I do think that, that um, in, in lots of ways, we, we do live in a cave. We do the best we can with it. Um, but we need to realize um, that we are forgetful and that we have this kind of continuity, even though we may be perfectly intact in the most obvious ways, uh, but it could possibly be uh, that we're more demented than we know. Um, yeah. Steve, Susan? Oh, oh, well, Jean, Jean, I know, let me get Jean and then Susan. Jean's hi, hi, fantastic. Uh, hi. hi, Harold. Um, hi, Jean. I, yeah, I, I really appreciate your reframing how we evaluate people we're with in terms of don't get caught up in the linear rationality or right from the beginning, that hypercognitive philosophy of personhood. I was working with someone who, um, and I'm not an expert in your area here, but who was struggling with dementia with a, with a parent. And I just had the thought, I said, do you have any pets? And, and she said, oh yes, I have a couple of cats. And I said, do you love your cats? She said, of course I love my cats. I said, well, they're not, do, they're not logical, rational, talking yes. entities. I said, can you bring that quality of love that you have for your pets? perhaps to your, your parents. And it was like, oh my God, yeah. yes. Nice point. And, and by the way, your cat can't call you by name. <laughs> right. Nor, nor can your dog. You know, so yes. time and time again, we hear, well, they've forgotten my name. I'm actually, I'm okay with names. I'm not as good as some people. So I, 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 I can you know, be walking down the hallway in this building and I will forget the name. I'll know who they are. And I know I've communicated with them in the last 48 hours, but there's so many students and so many people, I might forget their name. It doesn't mean that, you know, I've done some horrible thing. So we need to cut the deeply forgetful a little slack. You know, it's okay. They're there. They may forget your name, but it's not the be all and end all. But I like your, I like, I'm going to, I'm going to use that with your permission. <laughs> 
Okay. Namaste. <laughs> Susan, you were going to say something. Yes, yes. And these both of these last questions really touch on the thing that I can't uh, get out of my mind through your whole talk, which is the, the, the deep value of recognizing how much the thing we prize, our cognitive self, our rational self, gets in the way of the things that are truly valuable, our sense of awareness, our sense of our own inner spiritual life. And, and so that duality of saying that the other is demented, rather, I'd love you to speak on how our valuing those deeper sensibilities and being able to release our mind that keeps us so in this world might be brought to bear on Karen. So uh, wonderful stuff. And this is really the, the, the crux of it. You know, uh, the theologian Paul Tillich distinguished chronological time from Kairos. Chronological time is the time we live in. Like I'm, I gotta be somewhere at one. I gotta get there at two. You know, I get up in the morning, Kierkegaard talked about this in the concept of anxiety. I get up, I brush my teeth, I do, you know, everything's kind of routinized and ultimately empty because we're so fearful of the lack of control that we have over our frailty and our vulnerability that we want to create these routines that give us this false sense of certainty and security. So that's Kierkegaard. That's where the concept of anxiety came from, by the way, for psychiatrists in the room. And, um, uh, and 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 what what um, what Til Tilik loved Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard Tilik said, you know, we're so caught in in Chronos, we're so caught in time, and we don't even know if time is real. Okay. So he said we need to look out for Kairos, and Kairos is the Greek term for divine time. You know, the moment of perfect synchronicity, the moment when somehow things seem so perfect that you have what Jung called uncaused causality. And, and I think that, that um, when you're with a deeply forgetful person, you force yourself out of Kronos. So I can remember be, you know, being there with my grandmother uh, and doing this assisted oral feeding stuff. Because again, this was before they had feeding pigs and I, and, Thank heavens, um, but there was a there was a sense in which in those simple actions, um, I was transported beyond time and place, and you know the kabbalistic rabbis and the the gurus north of Delhi in the caves they all say that we're closest to whatever the supreme being is when we feel early in the morning as we rise up that we're beyond time and place. You know, I get up in the morning in Stony Brook, really, I'm a five o'clock riser, I'm even earlier, and I, I pray and meditate for a while, and then I, I come to, I'm always at work early. And, um, um, uh, and this is what the rabbis said. They said that, that, you know, you're not quite sure if you're asleep or not. You could be any place. I could be in Stony Brook, I could be in Cleveland, right? Um, you're not wedded chronologically, you're not wedded to space, in the same way. And so that's a time where you want to really, if you meditate, whatever you do as a spiritual practice, you want to connect at that point with something that is itself beyond time. Because as the Ayurvedic literature points out, uh, you know, the supreme being is, is, is timeless and, 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 and space and time are creations of the universe, which Einstein would have agreed with. So, so uh, there's something about, about those periods. That are really precious. But during the day, you know, I'm so caught up in activities. I mean, anybody who knows me knows I go a mile a minute. I mean, Renee, you remember that, right? I mean, I've been notorious for that. And, and um, uh, over, over scheduling myself, doubling up, uh, tripling up. And, and, uh, um, and so when I was with my grandmother, I, that was all out the door, that was gone. Because all I could do was be with grandma post, you know, and just, you know, 
have a little applesauce. It wasn't always sweet and pretty, you know, because you can get spat on, but, but it was a spiritual discipline for me. And it brought me into the now, into the pure present. And so like her, a person with dementia is, is freed from the temporal glue of connectivity between past and present and future. Well, they do have, because I talk about continuity and self-identity, they do have some past within them that can be brought out if you're, you know, if you're willing to bring it out and respect it, if you're willing to respect it. But you know, the future more or less disappears. And so you're, you're free of temporality by virtue of entering into their world. So that's why when Oliver Sacks says, you know, your wife mistakes you, for, uh, you know, uh, you, 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 what is it? The man who mistook his wife for a hat. Um, that's actually, that's okay. Because that's the world you're in. Thank you. Yeah, good, good job. We've got one other comment, then we got to go, Harold. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? One other short comment, because we do have to close out. Okay. Well, All right. Stephen, what a marvel. Just thank you so much. You know, many people are leaving comments, just how much they appreciated what you had to say. So thank you and God bless to you in all of your work and all of you who have been watching. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next month. Thank you, Harold. Renee, send me that address. <laughs>